October, I had the pleasure of attending the Write Women Book Fest 2023 in Bowie, Maryland. Being surrounded by 100 women writers awed me, and I had the chance to speak with dozens of them. Today, you're going to hear from seven incredible women authors. We'll explore what ignited their writing, the lengths of their literary careers, and whether they always envisioned themselves as authors. We'll also uncover what makes their chosen genre special to them. So let's dive in and hear the nuggets of wisdom they've so kindly passed forward. When I stopped by Cheryl Woodruff Brooks' table, I learned that she writes children's literature, primarily nonfiction. However, she recently released a fiction book, When I Look Into the Sea, which is for early readers up to age seven. Here's what she said when I asked her what inspired her to write this book. It rhymes because I love rhyming books. I'm a songwriter, so it just kind of goes hand in hand. When I look into the sea, is basically affirmations to children to believe in themselves, to believe in their dreams. So when they look into the sea, they see a reflection of themselves. And they don't really have to look outside of themselves to believe in themselves. So that's the overall point. I love that. Um, and also, by the way, I got to say, your illustrations are adorable on the cover of the book. Thank you. Uh, where, did you where did you find your illustrator? So my illustrator, believe it or not, and I encourage all of you aspiring authors to make use of Fiverr. I actually found an illustrator and she lives in Pakistan. Okay. And that's where you find your illustrator. Yep. Do you have any advice about what makes a good working relationship between you and your illustrator? Well, of course, you're not going to sit down and talk to them face to face. So I think written communication is the most effective tool you have. Be sure to clearly explain to an artist, illustrator, or anyone you contract what it is your expectations are for their work. So be sure you know what you want and communicate it effectively. Okay, so you mean like, here's an example of the types of illustrations I'm looking for right. and what I'm hoping this particular page will have on it or show? Right, I, I've told her what the book was about, mm -hmm. why I wrote it so they could understand my love of mermaids, my love of children. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, in my case, I said, I want diversity mm. in characters all complexions, all hair types, like any kid. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, what is your favorite thing about writing in your genre? I tell untold stories and that's why I like nonfiction. Um, I, I have focused in on beaches and in particular segregated beaches. Oh. And so I love, it's like I'm on a treasure hunt. It's like I'm an archaeologist. Oh, hey. So I feel like I wear a lot of hats that, that give me joy by being someone who digs up research on things of the past. Mm, that's very cool. What book are you specifically referring to for that one? Well, the, pretty much the rest. Uh, this was what got me a book deal right here, the Chicken Bone Beach. Mm. Um, Chicken Bone Beach is the first book I wrote about a segregated beach. Wow. And then I turned it into a children's rhyming book. Oh, so wow. I wanted to expand the reach of the audience. Yeah. Uh, I uh, did the same thing here. I did Golden Beauty Boss, which is a biography of possibly the third Black woman in America to establish millionaire status. Wow. And I converted it to a, a young adult age, okay. junior high school, middle middle school. Wow. Yeah. So you work with a variety of ages for your children's books. I do. Yeah. Uh, yes. Wow. And you wear a mermaid dress when you're reading your book to the kids. A mermaid tail. A mermaid tail. You are <laughs> correct. I loved your mermaid tail. And I have a picture of that. That'll be going up. Um, so that's wonderful. And I heard you uh, when you were reading a little bit from Chicken Bone Beach. Was that the one with the rhyming in it? Well, and no? every, well, they all rhyme oh, in they different rhyme. kind of ways. Okay. So Chicken Bone Beach. I wrote in a way to encourage the children to join in. Nice. So redundantly, you hear Chicken Bone Beach, Chicken Bone, Chicken Bone, Chicken Bone Beach. Well, I got this page five. I've got them in there, right? Yep, exactly. The, the talkers, the, the sweet little ones have been holding it all in. That uh -huh. I give them their cue. They're ready. Oh, I love <laughs> it. I love it. I love getting children involved in books early on. I've been reading to my kids since the moment. They were in my arms. Yeah. Um, honestly, I read my first book to my first child in the NICU. Yeah. So oh. I cry over that one. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, and so he's eight years old and he's going to be publishing his book soon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's yeah. it going to be about? It is about a baby snake who goes looking for cereal in the forest. Good luck with that. Uh-huh, right? Cereal, uh, huh? Uh, cereal. He wanted cereal. I mean, why not? Oh, adorable. <laughs> Uh, the imagination's on an eight-year-old. I love yeah, it. Yeah. I love it, too. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Do you have any last advice for aspiring writers? Right. Yeah. Write every day. Yeah. Write freely. Write what sets your soul on fire. And uh, as long as you love it, the world will love it. I love that. Thank you so much. E.R. Griffin writes not just fantasy, but also paranormal mystery and horror. With so many genres under her belt, I wanted to learn more about her books and the inspiration behind them. Today, I am showing off my debut novel, uh, The Queen of Ruin, which is the first in a fantasy series of five books. Very cool. Uh, working on the sequel now. Uh-huh. And I'm also here with Bad at Magic, which is my paranormal murder mystery. Ooh. And then um, I just have the promo cards for my third novel, The Witch of the Wilderness, which is my horror debut. Ooh, that is really cool. I love it. Um, So which authors inspire you in your genre? Um, I'd say my biggest inspirations were V.E. Schwab, who wrote the Shades of Magic trilogy, Neil Gaiman, definitely when I started reading that graveyard book, um, and Stephen King. Stephen King, very cool. Wow, so congratulations. How long did it take you to, which one took you the longest, actually? I'm curious. The Queen of Ruin took me the longest. It ultimately took me seven years. Wow. And like 10 drafts, and I just wouldn't stop editing it Uh until I just made myself stop. Yes, I completely understand that. I'm glad that you made yourself stop Yeah. and just make it happen. Yep. That's great advice for any aspiring author out there. Yeah, at some point, you just have to let it be what it is and let it exist in the world. I learned my lesson. Bad Magic took me three months to write. That's and amazing. I, I, and I was like, this is nice. Okay. I would say that the first book I find to be the hardest to write because you're also learning yeah. who you are as an author and Absolutely. what works for you. Definitely. Yeah. Do you have any final advice for any aspiring authors out there? I say just keep going for it. Even if you are getting like down and you're getting rejected by publishers, just do it. And you publish if you need to. Um, you'll always find your way. You're a legitimate author no matter how you're published. So just get out there and do it. I love that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Next up is Eden Apia Kubi, who writes diverse contemporary fiction. She is the author of Her Own Happiness as well as The Bennett Women. And when we first started chatting, I was curious to know how long she had been writing. I've been writing in earnest since, I want to say, 2011. I came back from the Peace Corps. And the last thing I did to make friends was get in a writing critique group. And so I hopped back in one again. And that's how my first book got written. Wow. Um, And then miraculously, that got a book deal in 2020. So that's how long it takes, folks. Keep plugging away. I love Uh, it. And then that was a two book deal. So that's how Her Own Happiness came to be. So what did you find to be one of the most challenging things about the writing process? And how did you overcome that? Well, I think that for people who are pursuing traditional publishing, it's great I, in terms of you don't have to figure out your production. You, I had a, a ton of support from my publisher, Mont Lake. I have the best editor in the world, um, Alison Dashiell. I'm going to shout her out every time I can. <laughs> but I was writing to see how far I could get. I wasn't prepared for a deal necessarily. I did not have a second book written. And so writing a full book in a uh, supposedly a year, um, actually in two, because it took three uh, extensions, was probably the hardest thing I ever, de- I ever did with writing besides childbirth. Yeah. Was writing a book in a year. And I had to try to, I, I outlined for the first time. I try not to be utterly consumed with the idea that, of writing. I only listened to audio books because I didn't want to get uh, literature slipping into um, plagiarism. I love audio books, but somehow they don't seep in as deep. Yeah. So that was my struggle. Well, not recommended, but you don't get to choose when you get your moment. So I had to just go for it. Yeah. So do you have any final advice for aspiring authors? I say find your people, even if they're virtual. The best thing I did was get online and make friends. Find your community. That's the number one thing. Number two, you don't know when success is going to come, for better or for worse. And so you have to find the reason to keep writing in the meantime. Yes. I was talking to another friend of mine who is also a book coach, Megan Clancy. She just recently released her episode. And she was saying how important it is to know or to set your intention behind your book, not just your intention of why you're writing, but why you're writing this specific story so that you can always come back and be like, this is the reason why I have to tell this story. 
Exactly. My first book I wrote, because I didn't see any diverse black heroines at the time. Mm. This, was, this was 2007 when I started. I didn't see any dark-skinned black women as romantic heroines. This is when Issa Rae was still on YouTube with an uh, awkward black girl. I just didn't see, like, black girls in their 20s at all on TV. They just didn't seem to exist. It's like either 16 or 40. And so I was like, you know, Tori Morrison says, um, the novel you want doesn't exist. You have to write it. Yes. And so um, I took the opportunity to write it. I knew that, like, there are people looking for that. And mm-hmm. so that's what kept me going. That's fantastic. I love that so much. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you for taking the time. One of the first authors I spoke with was Heather M., who writes Erotica. She published her first book, Madam X, Book 1.1, and we had such a fascinating conversation about what she loves most about her genre. I'm very interested in telling real stories, authentic stories about women and sex and and sort of their experience with intimacy and and sort of their sexuality. So I think there are a lot of boundaries that you can push in erotica, and that makes it really fun and, and exciting sort of genre to write in. That is awesome. I love that so much. You know, back in the day with uh, the Victoria era, and don't show an ankle. Exactly. Right? And so I love the idea of women being able to enjoy who mm-hmm. they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so important. So, and the name of your book that you have? It is Madam X Book 1.1. And mm-hmm. so the title was inspired by a painting, actually, that was done in sort of the 1800s by uh, William Sager Sargent, and it was entitled Madam X. She was a socialite in France. She was an American expatriate. Um, and so she was living there and she created a scandal by posing for this painting because the strap of her dress sort of fell down over her shoulder and it was considered very inappropriate. So I, I kind of love talking about those sort of, you know, little anecdotes and, and things that women have sort of gone through through the ages and, uh-huh. and sort of how can we sort of break through those barriers. And That is fantastic. Yeah. Well, any last minute advice for any aspiring writers out there? Just keep writing. Even if, you know, this is my first book and I'm still figuring out what I want to do next Mm -hmm. with it. But, you know, as long as you keep writing, if that's what you love, it will just it'll pay off for you either in sort of personally or professionally. So either way, just you you just keep writing and you keep writing stories and things that you love. That's fantastic. Um, I can tell you the number of times I say the word fantastic on my podcast, but I can't help it. It is fantastic. And I love talking to writers. I love being able to talk to women writers, especially yes. somebody who represents us this way. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, oh, real quick, how long did it take you to write this book? I said, like, book. Oh, it's oh no, wait, actually, I mean, this not, is the book. This is the I'm book. looking at your stack of, your stash <laughs> I have my stash of cards. Yes. Because okay, so I have book. just five books left. My other order did not come in in time, which is, you know, author problems, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. How long did it take to get an author copy? <laughs> so, um, but it took me about... A little less than a year, Very you cool. know, between editing yeah. and all that kind of thing. That's and, awesome. Yeah. Did you find an editor you drive with? Um, yeah. yeah, my partner, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm glad that that could work So that way. we work pretty well together. But yeah, I think the biggest challenge was the cover. So oh, yeah. The cover was something that took the longest, honestly. Yeah. Like, it just struggling what I wanted it to look like. So that Yeah, yeah. that is a very overwhelming process. Yeah, because judging a book by its cover is, uh-huh. is that thing. It really is. <laughs> it, really it really is. Really is. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. Right, well, thank you. During the festival, I had the honor of speaking with New York Times and USA Today bestselling author Janine Frost, who writes paranormal romance and also romanticy. As she said, it's basically vampire and romance. (laughs) She published both traditionally and self-published, so I was super excited to ask her about her experiences. But first, I asked her how long she's been writing books. I have been published since 2007. Wow. How many books have you published? Oh, um, I think I might be, including novellas, I think up to 30. <gasps> that is mind-blowing. <laughs> and I bow down to you. <laughs> Did you know you always wanted to be an author? Uh, yes. Yeah, since I first read my first romance novel, Way Too Young at Age 12, I fell in love with the genre and I wanted to be a writer ever since. What? Do you remember what that book was? Oh, yes, I remember. It's Sky O'Malley by Patrice Small, and I am dating myself with a reference because it's an oldie. (laughs) So you just spoke to my heart because I also stumbled upon my aunt's romance collection, Uh, read them way too young, and my very first romance book that I ever read was Thomas of the Rose by Brenda Joyce. Ah. I'm also dating myself with that one as well. Yes. Um, (laughs) But yes, the, the genre just stuck with me and I also always wanted to be an author. So you have made your dream come true 30 times over. Congrats. 
Can you talk to me about indie publishing versus trad publishing? Well, I mean, when I started out again, when dinosaurs roamed the earth in 2007, there really wasn't indie publishing. I mean, if so, it was very, very niche, kind of a very small side market. Uh, obviously, with the invention of Kindle Unlimited and with Amazon, it exploded. Mm -hmm. But I decided to indie publish my uh, most recent novella, Brave Girls Get Away, because I didn't want to make, uh, I didn't want to write a full book. The story was really only a novella, and bookstores generally want full length novels instead of novellas. So I knew that I would have to self publish that one to be able to get it out. So I chose to go indie with that one, and it was really a fun experience. It originally was in an anthology with two other trad authors, and we all did our anthology indie. And then we each split our stories out of it and self-published them, you know, as individual stories. So that was my first dip into the indie publishing, really. And then for my novel, The Other Half of the Grave, it was a retelling of my very first debut novel, but this time from the hero's point of view, because the book was originally written entirely from the heroine's point of view. And it started out as a free blog serial on my website. And I thought only a few readers will be interested because it was such an older book that I was retelling and the response was overwhelming. And I had so much fun writing it. I decided to write the entire story, which I did. And then I actually tried shopping at Trad, but um, the publishers were not interested in it because it was a retelling of an older book. And I understood that. I knew that was a risk going into it. But I really felt like there was been such reader response to it that I thought there would be enough readers interested in it. I went indie with it and it actually ended up hitting the USA Today and the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Look at that. <laughs> so I was really, really thrilled and shocked by the reader response. Wow. Congratulations. What a milestone to reach. Yes, that was that was a, a big, happy surprise. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'm also just thoroughly impressed with and admire you for is that trad publishers were telling you no and you didn't take no for an answer and you made it happen all on your own. And again, I don't, this is not to knock trad because, right. yeah, because I mean, I think that, I think what trad does a lot is they will check with bookstores and the big vendors and say, you know, would you buy in for this book? And if they say no, then Trent says no, and that makes total sense. Right. Um, and, you know, and again, it was a retelling of a book from 2007 mm -hmm. that I published last year. So that's a long time. And in publishing years, that's a thousand years. Um, so it was a gamble. Yeah. I, I understood why they passed, but I looked at my website stats when I was publishing it as a free serial. Yeah. And my stats were higher than they had ever been. Mm -hmm. And it, And I thought, that, you know, that meant that there were enough readers who wanted it. And I loved writing it. Yeah. And so I was, you know, I wanted to give it to them. The only avenue I had was indie. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I think it worked out really well. <laughs> uh, it most definitely did. That's amazing that you saw through. So congratulations. Do you have any last advice for aspiring authors out there? Write what you love. I mean, I think that's really important because at the end of the day, we don't know who is going to want our books as, as illustrated? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have to make sure to write the story that you want to tell and that you love. And then however you decide to go, indie is an avenue now and it's a very viable avenue. And that's exciting because, again, that wasn't the way when publishing was even back yeah, in 2007 or 10 or whenever. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I still love I, I still love trad as well. I mm -hmm. mean, I love seeing my books in bookstores. I'll be really honest because bookstores are like, they're like mini vacations to me. I love going into them. I love browsing through them. So, you know, you write what you love and you figure out which avenue for publication works best for you and then keep at it. And make it happen. Yeah. One way or another. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us. Thank you. One of the best parts of attending this festival was getting to finally meet in person friends I'd met and worked with online. And one of those friends is K.L. Richardson, author of The Sons of Skyland, which is historical fiction. I met Kim about a year ago, and I had the honor of being her inline editor. So her book, needless to say, is near and dear to my heart. When I interviewed Kim, my first question was if she always wanted to be an author. Uh, yes, I've been writing since I was probably in middle school. In fact, I was here at the conference thinking I wanted to thank all of my English teachers for letting me sit in the back of the class, pay no attention to what they were teaching and write stories, which is what I, I did. And I've been doing that now for, oh, 40 years almost. Wow. Yeah. That is amazing. So it's definitely been there all along. It has been there all along. 
And you have published your debut oh. novel. Yes, which, super exciting. Which is amazing. I have to say that not from any biased perspective whatsoever. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what it's about? It's called The Sons of Skyland, and it's basically the story of the Civilian Conservation Corps and how they were employed by the government to create the national park system and the state park system across the nation. Its focus is particularly on Shenandoah National Park and Camp uh, NP1, which is Camp Skyland. The main character's name is Seamus O'Brien. And he kind of represents all the boys, goes out on several different adventures that all deal with the ways that the park were created. Yes. Both the controversial ways and the... Correct. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a very interesting book. It yeah. is historical fiction. Right. And it has a bit of a love story in there, too. Yeah, a tiny one. Have to work that in. Yes, I love that. I love that. Wonderful. So now that you're a debut author, looking back on it, mm-hmm. what was one of the most challenging aspects of writing and publishing your book and how did you overcome that? Uh, The hardest part, I've had this story in my mind probably since I was in maybe high school and I originally thought that I wanted to write it as a straight up romance but that just didn't do justice to with the work that the boys had done. So I kind of switched over to historical in my mind anyway and I would tell people, oh, I'm going to write this book. Or they would say, you should write it. You should write it. And I kept putting it off, kept putting it off, thinking, yeah, one day, maybe one day. But then I met up with a great team of people. I actually taught with Maria Sequoy, who is in charge of the company All Right Well. And she kind of said, hey, do you want to come on board? I said, yes. And from there, it was just an amazing relationship. She absolutely worked with me because I'm not the most focused writer. <laughs> so she, we talked about how that was a stumbling block for me. I can't do my day job and write at the same time because creativity takes a lot of energy. And she helped me focus, gave me suggestions to overcome that and a deadline, which was super important. Yeah. Um, and then put me in touch with great people like, not unlike yourself, <laughs> who were able to make it a dream come true. So after all this time of just wanting and hoping and saying maybe someday, here I am at the Right Women's Book Festival and my book is for sale. So I'm, I'm excited and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to do it. I am so proud of you watching you evolve in your author career. So congratulations. Ten times over. Thank and thank you so much for sharing that with me. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for asking me to interview and being here with you. <laughs> Great. And we finally get to meet in person. No, super exciting. It is. It is. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Before we conclude part one of this compilation, I also interviewed sci-fi fantasy author Larissa Brandt. During the book festival, she showcased her dark sci-fi fantasy dystopian romance novel, Birthright of Scars. This duology is about a renegade who falls in love with his bounty hunter while he's trying to save his people from genocide. There's so much fun packed into that description. When we first started chatting, I asked her how long she had been writing books. And this is what she said. I've been writing since middle school. Oh, after my own heart here. (laughs) I'm loving that. And what has made the uh, biggest difference in your author career? Connecting with other indie authors and helping them with their books. That is amazing. So hi, I'm an indie author. (laughs) Yeah, but that is, I love that. How long did it take you to uh, write your duology? I started in the fall of 2020 and it took me two and a half years. So I really let it percolate and develop. Nice. Sat on it a while, kept working it over. Nice. So I just published my first romanticy book, Ruins and Redemption, and I daydreamed it into fruition. I spent about three or four months just daydreaming the plot. And then finally sat down and wrote it and realized that it was not one book, but more like four or five books. So that was fun. Uh, So you daydreamed a whole series. I daydreamed a whole series. That is exactly what happened. But book one is out now. So yay. So yes, if you let yours percolate, that is fantastic. And are you local? I am from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Oh, hello. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland. But you came all the way down here. Yes. Is this your first author event? It is my third author event, but my first time tabling in Maryland. Oh, very cool. Well, welcome to Maryland. I hope we've treated you well. They have. Everyone (laughs) has. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And best of luck in your author career. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. That brings us to the end of part one of these interviews with Right Women Book Fest authors. Tune in next time for more nuggets of wisdom from women authors who made their writing dreams come true. 